Good evening. Welcome to the Liberty Church of Christ to our midweek Bible study. We are going through the Bible. We are in the middle of a winter storm and many of us are just hunkered in. We've got the ice out there that's making it possible for us to travel. Uh, we've got others that are out there playing in it and having a good time slipping and sliding. Still, there's others that are decided to uh, just sit down with a good book and some hot chocolate. I saw that that somebody's doing, and that's more my speed here lately. But what better way to take advantage of this time to study the Bible? And you've joined us this evening to do just that. We are in tonight, 2 Samuel, and we'll cover chapters 1 through 5, and we'll also cover 1 Chronicles chapters 1 through 14. So get your Bibles and let's study together. We'll begin our Bible class with a prayer. Father, we're so very grateful that we can take this time to study your Bible, to understand your scriptures, to see the historical background of the Jews and your chosen people of the time and how they dealt with you and how you dealt with them. Help us to learn important lessons so that we can better understand the new covenant that you've made with mankind. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's about a thousand years before Christ was born, and David is going to be the next king appointed over Israel. Saul was the first king. He was anointed by Samuel, who was the last judge. Now Saul has died at the end of 1 Samuel, and the record of 2 Samuel begins, and it coincides with another record that we have in the Bible called 1 Chronicles. So tonight, let's go to 1 Chronicles and catch up to the point where David is made king, and that is the first 14 chapters. Let's look at 1 Chronicles chapter number 1. We begin these Chronicles with a genealogy of the folks prior to King Saul and King David. It leads us up to them. We see in chapter 1, we have the lineage from Adam to Abraham. And we've studied that as we went through the Genesis. We also saw Abraham's son in chapter number 1, Ishmael, or rather Isaac, and then we saw Isaac's children, Jacob and Esau. In verse 54 of chapter 1, we see the dukes of Edom. Edom is Esau. So, the Chronicles wants to chronicle the genealogy of Esau, or Edom. And he does so in chapter 1. Chapter 2, he picks up with Jacob, Esau's twin brother, who we know as Israel. In the first uh, couple of verses, he names all of Jacob's 12 boys, the 12 tribes of Is Israel. Now, beginning in verse 3, he picks one of those boys, and he follows his genealogy. And that boy is Judah. Now, we know that Judah is actually Jacob's fourth son. There was Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and then Judah. Why don't you start off with his fourth boy? Well, most likely it's because of David. David is in the tribe of Judah. And so the individual that is inspired by God to write the Chronicles is wanting to follow David's lineage. And he's wanting to follow Saul's lineage to get to his text. Well, David, in chapter number 3, is listed in his genealogy and follows his family. In chapter 4 of 1 Chronicles, there's more on Judah's lineage, but it also picks up with Simeon's lineage in that chapter. I want to note something here while we're following Judah's lineage in chapter 4 of 1 Chronicles. The chronicler decides, through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, as he's listing this genealogy, to pause in chapter 
uh, 4 verses 9 and 10 and mention somebody quite special. That's all we hear about him is those two verses in the whole Bible. His name is Jabez. Look at chapter 4 of 1 Chronicles, verse number 9 and verse number 10. We see that Jabez is given that name by his mother. And his mother gave him the name because while she was bearing him, she had a lot of problems. Now, it may be that it was a poor family and he's another mouth to feed. And that was the problem. Could be that she was having difficulty during her labor and giving him birth. But for whatever reason, she named him Jabez. Jabez means pain causer. How would you like to go all through your life being called pain causer? Come over here, pain causer. Well, that would be difficult. Another word that can be translated from Jabez is sorrow. All through his life, he was reminded of the sorrow that he caused his mom and his family. Well, he had a special prayer there in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, and it's got four parts to that prayer, the prayer of Jabez. And it's a prayer that you and I can pray. It may be helpful to us. The first part of that prayer, he says, Bless me indeed. You know, we should ask God to bless us. Bless us to glorify Him. Bless us to bless others. But we need blessings. We know that all good things come from above. And we need God's blessing. And it's, and it's no shame to ask for God's blessing. In fact, God wants us to ask for it. We have not, James says, because we ask not. We need to ask for God's blessing. But the second part of that prayer is enlarge my coasts. Enlarge my borders. Enlarge my boundaries. Now, he's not necessarily asking for more property. He's asking that his area of influence be enlarged. That's what we can pray. God, if you'll bless me indeed, I will use those blessings to help others. And I need that more people will be influenced by me in a good and a positive way. So God, enlarge my influence. The third thing is thy hand be with me. Once God blesses me, and blesses me indeed, and I start influencing more and more people, I need the hand of God with me. I need God to guide me. And then the fourth part of that prayer, and the final part, keep me from evil. You know, there's evil all about us. And Jabez prayed to God that he would be kept from evil. Now, that's kind of an, a two-way. I want to be kept from the influences of the evil world that may hurt me and do bad things to me. But also, I don't want to do evil in the world. I don't want to accomplish bad things. So I need to pray that prayer. God, protect me from the evil influences of the world but don't let me be an evil influence on the world. There's a purpose for that prayer given, and here is that purpose, that it may not grieve me. In other words, I don't want to cause pain. I'm Jabez. I'm a pain causer, and I don't want to cause pain. I don't want to be sorrowful to others and cause sorrow in others' lives. So God, if you'll bless me with these four things, I can be more helpful to those about me. What a great prayer, the prayer of Jabez. But in chapter 5, we learn that the chronicler is giving more genealogies for the tribes of Jacob. And we see in chapter 5, there's Reuben, Gad, and the half a tribe of Manasseh. Now, you remember those in our study already. These were the two and a half tribes that wanted to settle on the east side of Jordan, while the other tribes settled on the west side of Jordan. In verse 26 of chapter 5, we learn that it's, they were carried away into captivity because of their idolatry. That's going to happen to uh, all the tribes eventually. Well, in chapter 6, it picks up with another tribe, Levi. 
Levi, of course, is the tribe that Moses and Aaron were members of. In verse 25, we see another person that we remember in our study, Elkanah. You remember Elkanah in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. He is the father of Samuel. In chapter 7, it picks up with Issachar, Benjamin, Naphtali, Manasseh, the other half-tribe, Ephraim, and Asher. So six more tribes of the genealogy is picked up. Chapter 8, the chronicler picks up more specifically with Benjamin. Now, why does he do that? Well, because Saul, the first king of Israel, is of the tribe of Benjamin. And we see in verse 33 of chapter 8, where Saul was born and how that he was in that tribe. Make a note, interestingly, that Dan is not mentioned in this list of tribes. We don't know exactly why it's uh, suggested. It's because of what uh, the Danites did in Judges chapter 18 when they took that Levite and then they stole some uh, false gods and some idols. Uh, that could be the reason that God didn't include them in the genealogy here. Now, the Danites still exist. We're going to learn that from 1 Chronicles chapter 12, uh, verse 35, that there are some Danites around, but, but they're not listed in this genealogy. It's interesting to note, too, in the Revelation, chapter number 7, when it talks about the 144,000, which was 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, there, there were 144,000. If you multiply 12 times 12,000, but Dan is not listed in that group either. Just something very interesting to note. Chapter number 9 of 1 Chronicles, look at verse 1. So, all Israel were reckoned by genealogies, and behold, they were written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah, who were carried away to Babylon for their transgression. So we're going to see more of that as we study 1st and 2nd Kings and then following that in the historical record. In chapter 10, 1st Chronicle records the death of Saul. And you remember that as we studied last time in 1st Samuel chapter 31, how that Saul was wounded in battle and he asked his armor bearer to kill him because he didn't want to be captured by the Philistines and tortured and humiliated. The armor bearer wouldn't do it, so Saul fell on his own sword. Well, 1 Chronicles chapter 10 agrees with that record, how that Saul committed suicide on the battlefield. In chapter 11 and chapter 12, David is made king. He rules in Hebron first, and then he moves to Jerusalem. He's going to rule in Hebron for seven years. He's going to rule in Jerusalem for 33 years, which makes a total of 40 years in his rule. But it's not quite so simple how that he took the kingship from Saul after Saul's death. There was a, a, a bide for power. The chronicler does not tell us that in 1 Chronicles. We go to 2 Samuel chapter 1, to begin looking at the details of the transition from Saul being king to David being king. So everybody go in your Bible to 2 Samuel chapter number 1. You remember that David and his mighty men lived in Ziklag in the Philistine territory. They lived there for a year and a half. 1 Chronicles chapter 11 tells us some of those mighty men that came and joined him. You might want to read about those. We're going to see them again in 2 Samuel chapter 23 later on. A list of these mighty men, 37 in all. But there was not just those 37 mighty men. There were about 400 fellows and eventually 600 to come and join uh, 
David in Ziklag and, and in his efforts. You remember that Achish, the king of the Philistines, wanted David to join him in battle against Israel, against Saul. But the Philistines wouldn't have it. So they sent David back to Ziklag while they went and attacked Saul. When David and his men got to Ziklag, you remember that it had been burned by the Ammonites and their wives had been taken. David had went and rescued their wives. On his way back from that uh, rescuing uh, venture, he meets a man. The man has got his clothes ripped. He's, he's got dirt on his head. He's in mourning. David comes to him and said, where are you coming from? Well, the man had been in the battle that the Philistines had waged against Israel, where they had killed Saul and his son Jonathan. And the man tells him, I have just come from the battle. David said, well, how did it go? The man said, we lost. It was awful. Then David said, what about Saul? And his son, Jonathan, you remember how close David and Jonathan are. The man said, it's bad news. Saul is dead. David said, how do you know for sure that Saul's dead? The man says that while he was wandering in the battle, and back then when battle ensues, people go everywhere. And he said, I just so happened that I came up upon Saul, and he had been severely wounded. In fact, I just knew that he was going to die. And so he asked me, would you please kill me? Well, I, I did it. I killed Saul. I put him out of his misery. I didn't want the Philistines to take him and humiliate him. Now, that seems to contradict what we learn in 1 Samuel 31, where Saul fell on his sword and committed suicide. Or what we learn in 1 Chronicles chapter 10, where it tells the same story. It doesn't even mention this guy that came up and, and killed him. And it could have been that the guy did come up and find that Saul had been wounded in the battle. He had attempted to commit suicide, and he's, and he's still not dead. And it took that man to kill him. That could have been what happened. Personally, I think he did die when he committed suicide which would agree with 1 Samuel uh, 31 and 1 Chronicles chapter 10. It could be that the man came upon Saul and Saul was already dead. However, the man wanted to curry favor with David. The man knew that David would probably be the next king and that Saul had tried to kill David on multiple occasions. What a wonderful thing it would be if you could come to David and tell him that you had killed his enemy, paving the way for his success to be the next king. Oh, that man may have thought that David would give me great honor, put me in a place of position in the new kingdom. So the man told him, I killed Saul. And to prove it, here is his bracelet. And here's his crown. He actually did find Saul in the battlefield. He actually did find his crown and his bracelet as proof of, his, of Saul's death. Well, to the man's surprise, David did not reward him. David cried. David was sad to hear the death of Saul, and he was certainly sad to hear the death of his friend Jonathan. And he looked at the man, and he said, How is it that you're not afraid to destroy the Lord's anointing? So he commanded one of his men to go and kill that fellow. And the guy did. David looked at the fellow and said, your blood is in your own head because you destroyed the Lord's anointed. In the end of chapter one of 2 Samuel, David sings a song. Now we know that David has written many songs. When we look at the Psalms, David wrote most of those psalms. He wrote this psalm and he sang this psalm. If we put a title to it, it would be, How Art the Mighty Fallen. It was a tribute, a song of tribute to Saul and Jonathan, How the Mighty Are Fallen. Read that song for yourself. It's a beautiful tribute to those two men. In chapter 2 of 2 Samuel, God told David to go to Hebron. 
It's also recorded in 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. In those three verses, he went to Hebron. But 2 Samuel tells us more about what happens when he gets to Hebron. When he gets to Hebron, he's taken all of his wives, he's taken all of his uh, buddies that have joined him in Ziklag, and they anoint him as king in Hebron. Samuel is dead now, but he had anointed David already in Jesse's house when David was a shepherd boy. David knew that one day he would become king. This anointing is his second anointing, but it's his official anointing that he was king there in Hebron. He bragged on the people of Jabesh Gilead because those folks had went and found Saul's body that the Philistines had pinned to the wall along with Saul's sons. And they took the bodies down and they burnt the bodies. And then they took the residue, the bones, and they buried them under a tree there in Jabesh. And, and David said, you did the right thing. You're loyal to Saul. But why don't you join me? Saul is dead, and I can be your next king. Abner, who is the chief captain of Saul, <clears throat> would have nothing to do with it. He didn't want David to be the next king. He wanted one of Saul's sons to be the next king, to keep the kingdom in the family of Saul, the Benjamite, the tribe of Benjamin. He didn't want to give it to David, the tribe of Judah. So he took one of Saul's boys, Ishbosheth, and he put him to be the king. Abner was popular as the chief captain of Saul's army, and it wasn't hard for him to convince his people to acknowledge Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, to be the next king. So Ishbosheth ruled in his area for two years. His area included about 10 tribes. Uh, we know them as the tribes of Israel. There's 10 of them. And then down south are two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And there are the tribes uh, kind of down south. And that's where David had taken over control. He's going to be in Hebron for, for seven years. Ishbosheth, the first two years of that reign of David, is going to claim kingship in the upper area, supported by the chief captain, Abner. Well, Abner and Joab, Joab is the chief captain of David. They come together. Now, they're enemies. You've got Ishbosheth king, you've got David king, Biden for power is what they're trying to do to be king over the United Kingdom. So the chief captain of Ishbosheth, Abner, meets the chief captain of David, Joab, and they come together. They have a contest. There's 12 men against 12 men, and they kill each other. But it escalates into a battle. After the battle is over, we learn that Abner loses 360 men in that battle, and Joab only loses 19. So Joab is the victor. And Abner runs away. He's retreating. Now, Joab has two brothers, Abishai and Asahel. Asahel, the Bible says, can run like a deer. So he runs after Abner. Abner looks back and he tells Asahel, stop following me. If you don't stop following me, I'll have to kill you. Now, I don't want to kill you. Abner didn't want to kill Asael because he's Joab's brother. And Joab is a mighty man. You make Joab mad and you've got an enemy for life. So he certainly didn't want to make Joab upset, no more than he already was with him because of this battle. But Asael said, I'm not going to stop following you. I'm going to continue and I'm going to overpower you. Well, Abner turned and put the butt of his spear, which was sharpened, and stabbed Asahel, killed him right there. And then he ran on away. Joab and his brother Abishai came and found Asahel's body and buried him. But Joab is never going to forget that Abner has killed his brother. 
In chapter 3 of 2 Samuel, of course, there's war between the house of Ishbosheth, Saul, and the house of David. But David gets stronger and stronger. We learn that while he was in Hebron as king, he has more wives. He gets four more wives. That gives him six now. And he has six boys by those by those six wives, one from each wife. That indicates that David is growing. He's getting stronger. He's got a prodigy. And, and he's setting up his family uh, so that he can his family can be king for some time. Abner, who is Ishbosheth's chief captain, he's still alive, and he's becoming more prominent in his area of government. Ishbosheth comes to Abner and he accuses him of something. He said, You have taken my father Saul's concubine. Now, why is that a problem? Well, if a person takes the concubine or the wife of a king or former king, that puts them in a political position that they too might become a king one day. Basically, Ishbosheth is accusing Abner of trying to insurrect and come against him and claim the kingdom of some day. This makes Abner furious. He says, Ishbosheth, I made you king. I've supported you. I fought for you. I've helped this country, uh, this part of the country that follows you to become strong for you. And I fought against David for you. How could you accuse me of such a thing? I, Abner, will join David. That's a big blow to Ishbosheth because Abner is quite popular. But Abner does go to David and he says, I want to leave Ishbosheth and join you. Now, David welcomes that. Anything that David could do to get stronger, and certainly by getting Abner on his side, that will bring his followers over to his side and could put himself to be king of the United Kingdom, which he what he wants and what God has promised. So Abner meets with David, makes the promise that he'll go out on a campaign and rally the troops to leave Ishbosheth and come over to David's side. David agrees, so glad to do that. He said, but there's one thing I want you to do. When you come and meet with me, bring me Michael. You remember who Michael is. She's the daughter of Saul. David's first wife. Remember, Saul gave Michael to David. But when David went as a fugitive running from Saul, Saul gave Michael to another man. Now, Michael and that other man had sons, and we'll see them later. But David wants Michael back. Now, he's got six wives. He's going to have more concubines. He's even going to get more wives later, but he wants Michael back. And so he tells Abner, you bring me Michael to this meeting, and that'll tell me that you're serious about joining my side. Well, he gets Michael, and he brings Michael to David. Michael's husband follows behind for a long time, weeping and crying, and said, bring me back my wife. But he says, you go home. This is a matter of national security. So he takes Michael, Abner does, and presents him to David as a show that I am indeed on your side. Well, David allows Abner to leave that meeting in peace, to go on a campaign to get those folks away from Ishbosheth and bring them to David's side. Joab, the chief captain of David, hates that. He heard about this meeting, and he heard that Abner left in peace. So he goes to David, Joab does, and says, why did you do that? Why did you allow Abner to come here and have this important meeting with you? Don't you know that Abner can't be trusted? Joab doesn't trust Abner at all. He is the chief captain of the enemy, Ishbosheth, and he also killed his brother. So he is furious that David has, is even entertaining this coalition between Abner and David. So Joab leaves David, and somewhere in a dark alley, he and his brother Abishai murder. Abner. 
Now this sends a wave of confusion throughout all of Ishbosheth's people. I thought Abner wanted us to join David, and now David has got his chief captain and others to conspir conspiracy against Abner and murder and assassinate Abner. Wh what do we need to do? Do we need to join David or not join David? Well, David is genuinely upset because Abner's dead. He didn't want Joab to kill Abner. He saw it as an opportunity to unite the kingdom and David to be the king of that kingdom. He's, he's genuinely upset. So he cries and, and he gives a great speech, a genuine speech at Abner's funeral, talking about how great Abner was. And it's a sad thing that he's, that he's dead and, and we've lost a good man today. Well, all the people that follow Abner sees that David is genuine and that he had nothing to do with Abner's death, so they join him. Well, in chapter 4, Ishbosheth learns that Abner's dead, and that petrifies him. He is very upset. What is he going to do now? There's also mentioned in chapter 4 another family member of Saul, Saul's grandson. It's Jonathan's son. His name is Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was five years old when he learned that his daddy, Jonathan, and his grandfather, Saul, was killed in battle. He had a nurse. When that nurse heard about it, she picked up Mephibosheth and she, she ran. And she tripped. She fell. And it crippled the little boy, Mephibosheth. He's going to be crippled for life. Later, we're going to learn that there's going to be a relationship between Mephibosheth and David. But we'll see that as we go through the Bible. Ishbosheth has still in control of such as it was of his part of the kingdom. And so he's taking a, a noon nap. And some men come in and they assassinate Ishbosheth. They actually cut his head off. And they bring his head to David. And they're, and they're so proud of themselves. Oh, David, look what we have done. We have assassinated your enemy, paving the way that you can be king. Heard that before from the guy who claims to have killed Saul. Well, just like then, David's not happy with these men. So he ordered their execution. He took the head of Ishbosheth and he buried it in the tomb of Abner. This was a respectful thing to do, showing the country that I can be trusted to be your leader, to be your king. I know what politics is and I know what diplomacy is and I want to do the right thing. Well, in chapter 5, now that Ishbosheth is dead, the people do in fact come to David and they make him king. He's 30 years old when he becomes king. That could be a little Pepsi there. Pepsi, P-E-P-S-I, a physical example portraying spiritual intention. David was 30 years old when he became king. Jesus was 30 years old when he started his ministry. And there's so many Pepsis between David and Jesus, as we see as we go through the Bible. Well, after David was made king of the whole country, he decided to move the capital from Hebron to Jerusalem. Now, remember, he's going to be in Hebron for seven years, and he's going to be in Jerusalem for 33 years, a total of 40 years. But when he makes the decision to move the capital to Jerusalem, he calls upon the Jebusites. The Jebusites are the people who live in Jerusalem, and they're in control of the territory. And he asked the Jebusites, give me your city to be the capital city of the whole country. Should have been an honor, perhaps, but the Jebusites say, no, we're not going to give up Jerusalem. Well, David took it, and he established Jerusalem to be the capital city of the country anyway. Hiram, who is the king of Tyre, a neighboring country, wants peace with David, and, and he has obtained that peace. He, Tyre is a place where if you want cedar trees, that's the place to go to get him in his territory. If you want to build something out of cedar, they have the best. 
So he sends a bunch of cedar trees down to Jerusalem, along with carpenters and masons, and he he builds a house for David there in Jerusalem. Oh, it's a beautiful house. This is also recorded in First Chronicles chapter fourteen. Read all about that uh, incident of how he honored David by building him his house. Now, while David was in Jerusalem, he took more wives, he took more concubines, and he had more sons. And we'll see some of those sons as we go through the Bible. The Philistines heard that David had become the legitimate king of all of Israel, and they wanted to stop him. Just like they had put down Saul, they want to put down David. So they go against David in a battle. Now God tells David, David, I will give the Philistines to your hand. You will be victorious if you follow my plan, follow my battle plan. And when it happens, you'll be the victor. Well, David did, of course, follow God's battle plan, and it was his salvation. He won. That's a Pepsi with it itself. God has a plan for our salvation. And if we will follow that plan, hear the word of God, believe it with all of our heart, repent of our sins, confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, confess that we are sinners, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins, rise to walk a new life, live faithfully. That is a, a plan that God has put together to save us under the new covenant. And if we'll follow his plan, we will have salvation. David followed God's physical plan, and he got a physical salvation from the Philistines. Well, tonight we covered 1 Chronicles chapter 1 through 14. Notice that we left off 13. It corresponds with 2 Samuel chapter 6. We'll see that next time. But we also covered 2 Samuel chapters 1 through 5. And David is now in Jerusalem, set up as king over the United Kingdom of Israel. But there's more to the story, which we will pick up on our journey through the Bible. We hope to see you next week. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you once again for allowing us to study your Bible. And we pray that we will follow your plan because we know that your plan is salvation for all those who follow it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We hope to see you next week. Be safe out there during this winter storm in our area.